Okay, we are in uh, Romans chapter 7 this morning. Um, there is, uh, this chapter's got 25 verses to it, but it is, it is just loaded as every chapter here is uh, in this great book. As you turn to the book of Romans, try to put everything into its context. Uh, as you turn to chapter 7, here is, uh, here's a book that was written by Paul, one of his, uh, one of his many letters, but this, the book of Romans kind of stands out uh, on its own. Kind of, it's uh, kind of a, a theological masterpiece, as some people would call it, and uh, uh, he deals with a number of uh, the uh, Christian principles and uh, principles of Christianity that were so important for those early Christians to understand and important for us to understand. And uh, the major theme of this book is uh, established in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, that, uh, that man is justified by his faith in Jesus Christ. Through his obedient faith in Jesus, man can have justification, be made right in the eyes of God. And so he develops that theme in those early chapters talking about there's a need for this because we all sin. Jews and Gentiles alike, we all sin. But because of the grace of God, uh, he sent Jesus to die for us at the end of chapter 3. And we have the great gift of having the opportunity to be justified, made right in the eyes of God. And so starting in chapter 5, what he's doing we're in Romans chapter 7 this morning. Starting in chapter 5, there's about a four-chapter section where he, uh, he looks at the matter of, of how Christians are sanctified, how we have been set apart uh, through this justification process, how we have been set apart and been made free uh, by God from a number of things. When we were in chapter 5, we saw that uh, we were made free from the wrath of God because of the death of Jesus. Last week, we looked at chapter 6 where we, uh, we saw that we've been made free from sin. Now when we get to Romans chapter 7 this morning, what the, the major theme of this chapter is that we're made free from the law. And uh, for, for these early Christians, especially the early Christians of a Jewish heritage, this was, uh, this was a key thing for them to understand, is that, uh, that we have been made free from the law. It is not necessary for Christians to abide by the teachings of Jesus, and to go back and to hold on to those principles of, of Old Testament Judaism. And that's what some of these Judaizing teachers were trying to enforce, uh, trying to force these Christians to say, well, okay, you can follow Jesus if you want, that's fine and dandy, but you don't need to, you don't need to ignore and to turn aside from those, those principles of that old law that have been a part of our lives for so long. And so... This book has been developing this theme throughout, that we are no longer under the law. But he's going to deal especially with that in these first, especially the first six or seven verses of this chapter. Really going to focus in on uh, the fact that we are freed from the law and no longer bound by it. Um, you know, so think about, think about what this relationship between the old law and the new law. We now live under the new covenant. We now live under the New Testament. Well, what was the purpose of the Old Testament? Was it useless? Did it have no purpose? Well, of course not. It was a covenant. Who made this covenant? It was a covenant made with the Jews. Who made the covenant with the Jews? God made that covenant. Do you think God knew what He was doing? Unfortunately, I think sometimes have looked at, some people have looked at the Old Testament maybe as God's practice round. And, and then, he, then he got it right, he got it better when he got to the New Testament. You think God needed a practice round? You know, you, you go and watch a baseball game, if you get there early enough, you can see him doing batting practice, right? Warming up. You think God needed to warm up uh, before he got, no. Did the old covenant have a purpose? Yes, that old covenant, the very purpose of it was to bring man to Christ, to prepare man for that New Testament. But Man, is not, man cannot live under two different covenants, two different testaments, two different laws. And so the new law came and superseded, took the place of that old law. So he, look in chapter 7, verse 1. Do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, talking about the law of Moses. And here, here is the, the legal principle that he's going to state here at the beginning, then he's going to illustrate it, uh, and then he's going to apply it down in verses uh, 4, 5, and 6. But here's the principle. The law has dominion over a man. Now that could be any law. He's, gonna, he's going to deal specifically with it being the law of Moses, but this could include Roman law. It's any law. The law has dominion. 
jurisdiction, binding, has dominion over a man as long as he lives. He says, don't you know that? That's pretty clear, isn't it? The, are, are you bound by the, uh, the United States Constitution after you die? Are you, bound, are you bound by the speed limit after you die? If the hearse that you're being carried in is speeding down the road and gets pulled over by the cops, who's going to get the ticket? The guy in the driver's seat or the guy in the back seat? Who's going to get the ticket? Well, you know, you're dead. You're not under that law anymore, thankfully, right? Some of you'd like to not be under that law right now, but not so. The law is binding. The law has jurisdiction. The law is, has dominion over a man as long as he lives. So there, there's two points there. As long as a man is alive, he's bound by that law. But once he's dead, he's dead to the law. He's no longer bound by that. Now, that's, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Now, he's trying to get these Christians to understand this very simple principle. So he's going to draw an illustration. Verses 2 and 3 what he does is he draws a, a, an illustration to prove the legal principle in verse 1. Now, sometimes we've come to verses 2 and 3, and, uh, and we focus only on verses 2 and 3, and we think, oh, Romans chapter 10 is a chapter about marriage. Uh, no, Romans chapter 7 is not a chapter about marriage. Um, he, verses 2 and 3 are simply an illustration that he's drawing, and a great illustration because it does teach us about marriage. Um, but it's an illustration that he's drawing to, uh, to talk about the relationship that man has with the law, uh, especially the relationship man has with the law after he's dead. So verse 2, for the, woman ha who has a husband, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he does what? He's nice to her, as long as he's uh, making a living and providing nice things. How long is she bound to him by law? As long as he lives. Man, some of these husbands can live a long time too, can't they? She's bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But what happens if the husband dies? Don't, don't take it out of this context. Don't fill in the blank for me after the husband dies. If the husband dies, she is what? Released from the law of her husband. Now, if we were here to talk about um, the subject of marriage and divorce and remarriage, we might spend some time there at the end of verse 2 looking at how God phrases that at the end of that verse, that she's released from the law of her husband. She's released from the law of her spouse. That's an interesting way for God to say it. Because when two people get married... Let's see. They get married and somebody else joins them together. I'm trying to remember who that other... It's not the justice of the peace. I'm not talking about that. It's not the preacher. There's somebody else who joins them together. Can you help me out? I'm trying, God, that's right. It's God who joins them together. When, when a husband or a wife commit to each other, then I'm going... I, I'm committing to you as long as I live. You're committing to me as long as you live. That's a, that you're bound to that marriage law. You're bound to your spouse. You've made a commitment. And God has joined you together based upon that commitment. So if the husband dies, here, the key word in this verse is released. She is released from the law. Why? Because he's dead. When your husband dies, you're released from the law of your husband. So then, verse 3, if... While her husband lives, she marries another man. Well, wait a minute. If he's still alive, is she released from the law? No. Verse 2 says, if he dies, she's released from the law. Now, remember that, ver that this chapter is not a chapter about marriage. He's only using this as an illustration. This chapter is not about marriage and divorce and remarriage. He's only using this as an illustration. So this is not an exhaustive discussion about the subject. Did Jesus, in Matthew 19 and verse 9, did Jesus give an exception to this rule, to this law? Except it be for fornication. Jesus gave that innocent spouse a right to put away a guilty spouse. That, now, that is not 
discussed here in this section because this isn't a section about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. He's only using this as an illustration. So if you take these verses and combine them with Matthew 19, now you'll get a fuller picture uh, of, God's, of God's view of the subject. So don't get too concerned that the exception clause is not included here because that's not his point. His point is only illustration. Verse 3, So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man. She hasn't been released from her husband because he's still alive. She marries another man. She will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies... She is free. So verse 2 says, if the husband dies, she's released from the law. Verse 3 says, if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. What's his point? His point is in verse 1. The law has dominion over man as long as he lives. His illustration is about marriage that a husband and wife are bound to each other as long as they live. But if the wife's husband dies, well, she's not, she's not under that law of her husband anymore. She's been released, verse 2. She's been freed from the law of her husband, no longer bound to him. What's his point? Verse 4. How does verse 4 begin? Therefore, this is his point. Therefore, my brethren... And he would be addressing specifically his Jewish Christian brethren. By the way, in in this illustration that he uses, under that Jewish system, were the Jews married to God? In, in, in In a religious sense, were the Jews married to God? Yes, they were. Um, and so, you know, when, when they come along and say, give us a king so that we can be like everybody else, well, who are they not satisfied with? They're not satisfied with who they're married to. We want to be married. We want to have somebody else. But when you read through, especially through the prophets, when you read through the prophets and God uses words to talk about Israel's condition, their spiritual condition, when he uses words like harlotry and adultery to describe their spiritual condition, we, we understand heart, we understand prostitution, we understand harlotry, we understand adultery when it comes to a physical relationship, fleshly relationship. Why was God using those terms to talk about their spiritual relationship? Because they were married to God. When they went and started serving other gods, worshiping idols, all of a sudden what were they doing? It's not just idolatry, it, it is that. It is idolatry because they're worshiping idols. But when you turn your back on who you're married to, God, it's not just idolatry, now it's harlotry. You're going and committing adultery against God. And that's these Jews that he's writing to, these Jewish Christians, they would have understood understood that concept. Verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also, you, he's saying to these Christians, you, here's his application of this, you have become dead to the law. Remember, remember, husband dies, released from the law. Husband dies, freed from the law. He says, that's you. You've been released. You've been freed. You are dead to the law. The, the word dead is, death is a separation. You've been separated from the law. Well, how did that happen? Through the body of Christ. What happened to that old law when Jesus died on the cross? Colossians 2.14, it's nailed to the cross. We, it, it was abolished, he, Ephesians, Ephesians 2.14, 15, 16. He, that law was abolished. It was taken out of the way when Jesus died upon the cross. So when this says, through the body of Christ, it's saying the exact same thing, that you became dead to the law. You have become dead, separated, freed, released from the law when Jesus died upon the cross. Now why did that happen? so that you may be married to another. Well, if they weren't dead to that old law, and then they went and married another law, what would they be doing? Well, that'd be be spiritual adultery. If, if If they're under the old law, and they go and adopt and marry to another law, well, now you're committing spiritual adultery as it were. So what is he saying? You're dead to that law. What is that? What is that? That releases you, that frees you to go and marry be joined to, be bound by another law so that you can be married to another 
That is who at the end of verse 4? To him who is raised from the dead. You have been released from that old law so that you can be married to Christ. That's the immediate purpose. And then the ultimate purpose at the end of verse 4 is that we should bear fruit to God. We have been freed from that old law in order that we might serve God. You think these Jews, is, is this hard to understand? I mean, when, when you lay out the principle, law has dominion over man as long as he lives. Yeah, that makes sense. He's, I don't, law is not over me when I'm dead. When he illustrates it, yeah, I get the illustration about marriage. That makes sense. Verse 4, that's you. You've been freed from that law. You're not under that law anymore. That law has been nailed to the cross. Verse 5, for when, for when we were in the flesh... Now, this might be a little tricky, but what does this mean? When we were in the flesh, does that mean they weren't in the flesh anymore? Ooh, wow. Paul, what are you talking about? Uh, Are you now now some kind of a ghost? What do you mean mean you're not in the flesh anymore? What is he doing? He's contrasting two different laws. That old law was a fleshly law. That old law, uh, the, uh, the Jews were descendants, fleshly descendants of Abraham. What, what, was the, what, was the, uh, what was the sign of that covenant, that, that, that covenant that God made? What was the sign of it? You had to be circumcised. It's fleshly. Is that, is that the new law? Is the new, no, the new law is not of that nature. So he's saying, when we were in the flesh, talking about when we were under the law of Moses, before we became Christians, before we were converted, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, uh, meaning that the law revealed uh, what sin was. Uh, The law told us what sin was. Uh, Those sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our bodies, in our members, to bear fruit to death. Notice the contrast. When we're under Christ, we bear fruit to God at the end of verse 4. But when we were under that old law, the only thing it could do was to condemn us to death because we broke that old law. But now, notice the word now, verse 5, past tense, when we were under that old law. Verse 6 is now as Christians. But now as Christians, we have been delivered from the law. Now I want you to see, four, I think four different ways he has said this so far. Released from the law in verse 2, free from the law in verse 3, dead to the law in verse 4, delivered from the law in verse 6. Is that hard to understand? What's their relationship to the law? Uh, Released, free, dead, and delivered. Oh, uh, we're not under that old law anymore. We're as as separated from that as as can possibly be. And he's used four different words to describe that. But now we have been delivered from the law. Those who are in Christ are not under that law. They're separated from it. Having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Remember chapter 6, we were raised to walk in newness of life, and that's that's our purpose under Christ. We have been raised to serve. We've been given life to serve. It's one of those paradoxes of, of Christianity. You've been freed from sin, and now you're a slave of God. Somebody think freedom and slavery, those don't go together, do they? Those are like contrary to each other. They don't fit together. But under God's system, they do. And we saw that. We didn't really get to develop it much um, at the the closing verses of chapter 6 last week. Uh, But but those those who are in sin, who are enslaved to sin, well, they they have no freedom. They, They are free from from God's forgiveness. They're free from God's law, but those who have been freed from sin by God, now they are slaves of God, to serve God. Um, Now, we're going to tie verse 7 in with this, because as you read through this, what law is he talking about? You say the law of Moses. Let me ask you, what part of the law of Moses What part of the law of Moses? Is this on, when he says the law has dominion over a man in verse 1 as long as he lives, what part of the law of Moses is that talking about? Is that talking about a part of it or is that talking about all of it? 
When he says that we have been released from the law, freed from the law, dead to the law, delivered from the law, what part is he talking about? There are some who have tried to separate the old law into two parts, into a ceremonial law and a moral law. Ceremonial law having to do with all of the ceremonies, the feast days, the sacrifices, all of the ceremonial part of that old law. And then they say, but then there's the moral law, the Ten Commandments. And they've tried to separate the two from each other and say, sure, when Jesus died upon the cross, the ceremonial law was crucified with him, was nailed to the cross, was put away, was abolished. But the moral law wasn't. The moral law, the Ten Commandments, are an eternal law to continue to be over us perpetually. They've tried to separate them, and in some circles they've been successful in convincing people that that's the case. That there's two different systems here. One was done away with, but, that, but those Ten Commandments, you know, those Ten Commandments, they were special. Right? Those were the only ones God wrote on a stone with His finger. Right? He didn't write the other uh, 603 different commandments of the old law un with his finger on stone, but only those 10. So those 10, they must be intended to last forever. Right? Is that what he's talking about, Tasha? Right? That's true. Uh, the, uh, of the Ten Commandments, nine of them have been um, brought into the new law by Christ, brought into this new system by Christ, uh, except for the, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But Tasha, that's the very reason that those Ten Commandments have to continue to abide. They're, they're not concerned about thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Yeah, 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 we got all that. But those Ten Commandments have to continue to live and abide because of, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That one has to stick. And so if we can separate them and show, no, they're two different things, and if one can continue to abide, then, then, that, then that fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, has to continue to abide. Look in verse 7. What shall we say then? And he's going to ask a couple of questions in this section uh, down to about verse 13, he's, he's trying to help them to see the relationship of the law because uh, some people might even say, well, you don't need any law. So he asks a couple questions and tries to deal with this. But I want you to see verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Uh, is it sinful? Is it responsible for uh, causing us to sin? But again, I want you to see the words, the law. What part of the law is he talking about? Certainly not. On the contrary... I would, have, I would not have known sin except through the law. How many times have we seen that statement? The law, the law, the law. I wouldn't have known sin except through the law. What part of the law is that? For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Ten, let's see. There, there's a lot of commandments in the Old Testament, right? 613 of them uh, in, in that Old Testament system. That's a lot of commandments. Have you memorized all of those? All 613? Are you working on it? I mean, how many are you up to? Uh, that'd be hard to memorize all of those, right? Do you, remember, do you remember one of them saying, you shall not covet? Remember one of the 613 that said that? Oh yeah, you remember, why do you remember that one? Because you have a problem with coveting, and that's, that's, that's the one that, you, that you've adopted and memorized. Why do you remember this one? Because it's part of the Ten Commandments. Isn't it interesting that here in this very section, where God is emphasizing over and over, we've been released from the law, we've been freed from the law, we are now as Christians dead to the law, we've been delivered from the law, we've been separated, we're no longer under the law. Okay, what, but what part of the law? Or is he talking about parts, or is he talking about the entirety of the law? I would not have known the law, the one that we're not under anymore except the law had said, you shall not covet. If you get into a discussion with someone who wants the, the perpetual following of the Ten Commandments and the, perpetu and the perpetuity of, of that, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because, oh, it's a part of the Ten Commandments. Is you shall not covet part of the Ten Commandments? Yes. 
Yeah. And guess what? We're not bound by that law anymore because of everything that those first six verses just said. So does that mean we can covet? Cool. All right, I thought that one was gone, but all right. I, does it mean we can covet now? Well, no. Because the law that we are under teaches us to be uh, content with such things as you have. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, uh, and, and don't covet other, other people's possessions. And we can see Colossians 3 in a number of different places that teach us not to covet. So yes, it's a part of the law of Christ, but we're, we're not... Covet, covetousness is sinful for us today. But only because the New Testament teaches it, not because the Old Testament teaches it. Look in... Uh, Look in, look at a couple places. Look in Nehemiah chapter 9 real quick. I'm going to throw just a couple verses at you that you might tie in with this because it is, it is very prevalent today to think about or, or to hear this idea that, uh, well, we're still, under the ten, we're still under the Ten Commandments. We're still under the law of the Sabbath. Look in Nehemiah chapter 9. You know what? Hold your finger there and go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. I want to start in Deuteronomy 4 and, and see this from the beginning to the end. Hold your finger in, ne in uh, what book did I tell you? Nehemiah chapter 9. And uh, look in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And remember when you're looking in Deuteronomy chapter 4, that here in the book of Deuteronomy we have a giving of the law again. Deutero second. Uh, it, it is the second time that this law is being given because it's the second generation that's now come out of Egypt. And, uh, and so in the book of Deuteronomy, look in chapter 5 and verse, well, look in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Moses called all Israel, and he said to them, to who? All Israel. Hear, O Israel, you Jews, descendants of Abraham, the statutes and the judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with who? Us, 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 us. Who's that? Us. Who's doing the speaking here? Moses. Who's he talking to? The Jews. So Moses is saying to the Jews, God made a covenant with us, the Jews, the Israelites. Now, where did he make this covenant? At Horeb, otherwise known as Sinai. That's how we know it a little better. God made a covenant with the Jews at Mount Sinai. Had he made this covenant with the Jews some other place? No, at Sinai. Had he made it before this time? No. It was a covenant that he made with the Jews at Mount Sinai. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, what do you notice about, oh, say, verse 7, uh, verse 8, uh, verse 11, verse 12, observe the Sabbath day, verse 16, Verse 17. What do you notice in these verses in Deuteronomy chapter 5? It's the Ten Commandments. He is, he is giving, repeating these Ten Commandments for the second generation. Now, when did God do that? Well, He made that covenant with them at Horeb. Back up to chapter 4. This is where I wanted to see one verse. Look in chapter 4 and verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 13. So God declared to you His covenant which he commanded you to perform God made a covenant with his people where at Mount Sinai that covenant included all of the regulations that he gave under that old system including in verse chapter 4 verse 13 including the 10 commandments so when God talks about a covenant that he made at Mount Sinai we, you're thinking, of course it included the Ten Commandments. And, and you're absolutely right, but there are a number of people who say, no, it didn't. What did this just say? I made a covenant with you, and I made it at Mount Sinai. Now come back to De Nehemiah chapter 9. Still got your finger there? Look at Nehemiah chapter 9. This is like beginning and end. Deuteronomy is the beginning of, of, of the history of the Israelites, in this, at least the second generation, before they go into the promised land. Nehemiah chapter 9 is the end of that history, or nearing the end of, of the recorded history of the Old Testament. Look at verse 13 of Nehemiah chapter 9. You came down also on Mount Sinai, Horeb, which we saw in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy. It's where he made a covenant. And spoke with them from heaven. You gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and 
there at Mount Sinai, what did you do in verse 14? You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of your servant. At Mount Sinai, what did God make known to them? His holy Sabbath. When God said, you shall remember the Sabbath, you shall keep the sa- remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Nehemiah says that that was something that God told his Jews in that covenant that he made with them right there at Mount Sinai. Not something that was before that, something that he established right then. But it was not to be a perpetual forever covenant because that first law was taken out of the way in order that we might be under a new law. And we could, uh, we could look at so many different passages to, to help us to see that when God talks about His covenant, in that Old Testament, it included every bit of it, Old, uh, the, including the Ten Commandments. And I know you're sitting here thinking, that's as obvious as, you know, as, as I'm sitting on a pew, it's that obvious. Well, it's not for some. And uh, it's important for us to put the entirety of Scripture together. Gary? Sure, sure. Well, you, we ha- we've got to remember that when, when we're reading the book of Genesis, who is writing the book of Genesis? Moses. Moses is writing this book um, 2,500 years after these things transpired. Uh, so he is writing a historical account of what transpired. Now, did God rest on the Sabbath day? Did God rest on the seventh day of creation? Yes, he did. Does it say... Does it say that God made a covenant with His people and told them to do the same? Oh, it doesn't say that. So we we don't need to read into a text what somebody wants to... It just says what God did. But it does not say God made a covenant with all of creation and told them, you do exactly as I have done from here on out. Never said that. Uh, And and what does the word Sabbath mean? Is it a rest? It was a rest that, that they were to observe on that seventh day. It, now, on the Sabbath, they were to... When, when somebody takes a sabbatical today, what does, that, what, does that, what does that indicate? By definition, what does that indicate? They're taking a rest, taking a break, okay? So the Sabbath, by definition, was a rest. And so in Hebrews 4, when God dis- uses that word to describe heaven for us, guess what heaven is? It's a rest but only on the seventh day, right? When you go to heaven, you only get to rest on the seventh day. And with God, you know, when you get to heaven, we don't know how he's going to measure the days, so, you know, you might only get to rest every, oh, let's say, 7,000 years. No, he's using a word that by definition means a rest and says here is what heaven is going to be. It is going to be a place of rest, which is is, uh, emphasized other places uh, in Scripture as well, but uh, you know, I, I I think it's important that when we gather what the what Scripture teaches, we need to gather it all together. We need to handle it as as Paul says in Second Timothy, Second Timothy two and verse fifteen to handle it aright, handle it accurately. Make sure we pull it all together uh, and collect all of the information, and then see what all of the information says together. And what is this telling us in Romans seven? Come back to Romans seven because we've got. Eight minutes to finish the chapter. What is this, these first seven verses teaching us? We're not under that law. We're not under any part of that law. We are now separated from and dead to that law. Well, but what does that mean? Does that mean that the law had no purpose? I mean, no. The law was not sinful. That's the question he asked in verse 7. Is the law sinful? No. It was good for its intended purpose. Well, what was its intended purpose? Well, Verse 7, Paul says, I would not have known sin except through the law. The law tells us what sin is. Now, that's Old Testament and New Testament. Um, Would we know what sin is 
if God didn't tell us. The law reveals to us what sin is. Um, in verse 8, But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, um, with, uh, that without the law, sin was dead. Uh, and, and, and obviously that would be the case, because if there was no law, could I sin? If there was no law, I could not sin. And this is about the second or third time he's kind of emphasized that point in this book. Verse 9, I was alive once without the law, without knowledge of sin. Without the knowledge of sin, without the law, I, I was alive. I felt that I was alive. But when the commandment came, the law came, sin revived and I died. What's this talking about? Here, here, here's... Here's someone living their life and they come to a knowledge of the law and realize they are in a sinful condition and that they are separated from God. Verse 10, the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. I realized that here was a law that could not make me right with God. It could not make me perfect with God. I, I violated this law, this old law, and when I violated this old law, it could not justify me. It could not make me right. Verse 11, and what... What he's doing here when he's talking about the law and sin, he's almost personifying. Uh, he personified the law uh, a couple of verses up. Now in verse 11, he's kind of personifying sin. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me. Isn't that what sin does? Deceived me and by it or through it, it killed me. You know, sin, sin, sin will make you think, well, it's not so bad. Sin will give you a vain hope. Well, you, you can do this, and, and you, don't, you don't have to worry about what the law says. Isn't that what Satan was doing in Genesis chapter 3? You shall not surely die. Wait a minute, but God said I should. Yeah, but you shall not. And it leads you down a path to, to violate the clear and defined law of God. But he says, you need to understand, verse 12, to answer his question from verse 7, is the law sin? No. The law is holy. Well, if the law is holy, where's the problem? Problem is with man. The law was perfect. Problem was with man. The law is holy. And the commandment, holy, just, and good, the problem is that man could not keep it, did not keep it perfectly. Has then what is good become death to me? Of course not. Here's the law. Is, is that now, is that now, is the law itself causing me to sin? No. But sin, this is an interesting way to say this about sin. Again, personifying sin. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through the law, through what is good, so that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. Think about that. Sin might become exceedingly sinful. What's the purpose of the law? It's to show us what sin is. It's to show us the nature of sin. It's to show us just how sinful sin is. And that's a weird way to say it. I mean, do you talk about how dirty dirt is? I mean, dirt is dirt. Is it dirty? Well, of course it is because it's dirt. You know, you don't really talk about how dirty dirt is. Sometimes we don't talk about how sinful sin is because, well, of course it's sinful. It's sin. God says you need to understand how sinful sin how, how does it describe it here? How exceedingly sinful is. Well, how do I know how exceedingly sinful sin is? The law teaches me that. So is the law, is the law purposeless? Is it worthless? Absolutely not. Helps me to understand the, the seriousness of sin because what does sin do in verse 13? It produces death. The wages of sin is death. Now starting in verse 14, and, and you, we may be familiar with, with this section of Romans chapter 7, and uh, we don't have time to really develop the context of this. It's important not to take anything out of its context. Remember what he's been talking about here? He's talk, been talking about the relationship that somebody has with the law, a relationship that a Jewish Christian particularly would have with the law. But he's going to try to, again, make an application of that and help them to see uh, their relationship to the law. And we really feel... Personally, these verses, what he's going to say here, because what he's going to deal with is kind of an inner conflict. Now, again, the context of this has to do with the law, 
But we have this same inner conflict even within our own selves. Look at verse 14. And he kind of repeats himself here, but we'll just read it through. For we know that the law is spiritual. It's good. But I am carnal. I'm fleshly. I'm sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that's what I do. If then I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's good. The law is good. The law is not to blame. It's the sin that's the problem. Verse 17, but now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I've given my life, I've been so long trained by sin, it's almost become a habit for me. For I know, verse 18, then it, uh, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to, will is, uh, for to will is present with me. I want to do what's right, but how to perform what's good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do it. But the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I do. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's this stubborn, long-trained habit of sin and fleshly living that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, a tendency, that this law of power of temptation. Evil is present with me, the one, the person who wants to do what's right. I want to do what's right, but there's these two laws, this tendency to do wrong, and then there's the law to do what's right. Verse 22, for I delight in the law of God, it's good. I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, according to my mind and my will. I want to do what the will of God says, it's good. But I see another law, the rule of sin, as it were. I see another law in my body and my members, warring against the law of my mind. I want to do what's right in my mind, but what does my body want to do? <sighs> it wants to do wrong. And bringing me into captivity, the law of sin, which is, my, which is in my members. You ever felt this way in verse 24? Oh, wretched man that I am. I want to do what's right, and I don't do it. I don't want to do what's wrong, and I end up doing it. And back and forth we go, and Paul says, I've got these two laws working within me. I've got this dichotomy within me that, uh, you know, I'm fighting to do what is right and according to the will of God, and yet I feel that I'm a wretched man. A question, and then an exclamation to finish this, this, this chapter. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Aren't you glad that God does? And that's what he says in verse 25. I thank God. But is that delivery come through the law? No. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God that it's not the law that we have to please, but it's Jesus. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's the one who delivers us. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God. But with my stubborn flesh, I've got this law of sin. But I'm trusting in God and I'm thanking God that I've got Jesus Christ as my Lord. There is so much in those verses, and I wish we had time to dwell on them a little bit more. But hopefully some of this has helped this morning to, to, to see that under, under New Testament Christianity, we're freed from that law and not bound by it anymore. Thank you all for your very good attention this morning.